Hello zusammen und uh, hello everyone. Um, es ist schön, dass Sie da seid. It's all, it's all very good that you're here. Um, welcome to the first part of our new lecture series on the cost of civilization, reciprocity and natural law. Firstly, I would like to deeply thank Paul for helping us be here today. Thank you, thank you Paul. Uh, he's in wonderful <laughs> I, if we got that right. Up now, I would like to introduce Rick, a student of history, geology, religion, and theology. He will be explaining the origin of freedom and how it is a state of exception and not the normal. Rick. Thank you very much. Yes, uh, thank you, Sean, for the prestigious invite today. Yes, uh, we would like to talk about how freedom isn't the norm. It's an assumption in the West that everybody should be like us or the course we took was the norm. As it turns out, this is the state of exception. This is a unique position we're all in right now and the world we're living in was a result of many things that uh, all added up, there was a combination of geography, systemic collapses and individuals who pulled us out of these dark times and left us with the world we have today. We could begin the thing uh, regarding that, where did reciprocity begin? You could say the Toba disaster, 70,000 BC, we went from troop to tribe. We elevated ourselves above the animals and became what we'd say today is like modern homo sapiens. In archeology, span we notice around the 70,000 BC mark, we begin obsidian beads start appearing in the strata. We also see in the people who are existing in the areas today in Africa, still have these beads and they are symbolic of trust. The idea is if you've got several pairs of beads, that gives you access to other people's lands. Likewise, they have access to yours. That's the beginning of trust building up. Then we could move the story forward to the Younger Dryas period where we have, so like I said, the Toba disaster, systemic, you know, absolute. We have no idea how bad it were today. It would have been unimaginable living through a super eruption and having the human population reduced down to 3,000 breeding females. That's where everybody in this room comes from. Everyone is, in theory, out of West Africa. Uh, like I say, we go forward to the Younger Dryas period, around 10,000 BC. Again, their world begins changing. We have the end of the hunter-gatherer culture. It then becomes sedentary. We begin seeing people living together in groups. The beginnings, the formation of religion begins. Writing also appears. Uh, we could look at another systems collapse. We could look towards the Neolithic, old European collapse where we had the Neolithic agricultural community replaced by the Yamna culture. At which point then we get to like, we could say then the archaeological record, uh, we get now to actual source documents. So then we get to the next collapse, the Bronze Age collapse. Now, in this time, the Greeks always viewed the past as a golden age. And that's because in the Mycenaean world, it was a lot, how would you call it now, um, the concept of a dark age, it's called radical economic reduction. So the Mycenaean world, it was far greater than the people who lived in the ruins later. The example of this is Homer's uh, Iliad. And that is the first book that we have, the first narrative in the West. Beforehand, all we have is linear A and B script, whereby we have inventories. It's only after the Bronze Age collapse, the thing called a narrative begins. And our first narrative is the Iliad. And we begin seeing, obviously, there's some disconnect. Homer is clearly maybe 100 years, maybe 80 years out of sync with this time frame. So when it, even though the Iliad is claiming to be a source document of the time, it's clearly written afterwards. But we're getting some crucial details in it. We start seeing a concept forming whereby we've got, it's, for example, in Egypt, a king is a god in his own way. In the Middle East, a god told me so. So I can unite city-states. In Greece, we had a different one, a very unique situation, and it only appears in the West where they claim to be sons and daughters of the gods. So you've got Pharaoh is God, God told me so, we are sons and daughters of the gods. Now, if that's the case, we are more sovereign than other people because we are viewing ourselves in that, in that light. Well, if we are sons and daughters of the gods, then we are now our own people, we've got our own mind. So that would then lead us up to then the, and I'd call it the uh, bias of the modern, because we have more source evidence, we'll be talking about the, the dark age we all know, the one that Edward Gibbon coined the phrase 475. Now, this is, that's the, 
the point where our story begins, like where our present world comes from. In 475, that, that was Edward, Edward Gibbon's view of when society changed. That was when uh, the last Roman emperor was deposed. The slight problem is, is when we, when we go back through the data, we find out that there were systemic failings in the Roman Empire, and it began, it's the crisis of the third century, uh, in around 280. Now, one of the main problems in the Roman system is, is there was no clear succession policy. There was no, like, you know, my son will rule. We have this problem whereby there's many contenders for a throne. We also have, and obviously, like, no offence to the Germans, but as the, uh, the Roman Empire was being pressed by hate using the word barbarian tribes, people of Germania, according to the Greeks, because uh, the Romans borrowed the Greek word. Like I said, they called you Germani, uh, Germani, uh, and the Romans just borrowed their word for it. Now, the problem with the Roman Empire is, is that they, originally there was a quote I read in an history book, and it was saying how it's so parallel to the modern day, it's quite eerie, it was saying you could take your money, go and trade somewhere else all across the empire, you could send a letter, and it could, in theory, get there a few weeks later. You could even, there's cases of Romans going on holiday, visiting uh, places like the Tomb of Alexander the Great and things. So we go from this, like, uh, interconnected world, whereby it mirrors the modern. This then begins to collapse. We've not just got systemic mismanagement of the Roman Empire, you've also got the pressing of the barbarian tribes. One of the issues, and this is where our society begins, diverging slightly from, again, what was before, Society becomes more militarised to deal with this. So you've got what happens in the Roman Emperor, they had a phase of the good emperors, where a guy would appoint not his son, but a good guy to do the job. That only worked for a certain number of emperors before you started getting the bad effect, or someone, oh, that was a bad judgement call. We get something called the reign of the barracks emperors. These were people who was, from the provinces usually, they weren't intellectuals. They were like hard fighting guys and the, local, the, the band of soldiers would elevate them by lifting them up on a shield. And you had a reign of these people called barracks emperors. Now one of the problems with this in response to the world changing, society becomes more militarised, it requires payment for these soldiers to operate. Now during the crisis of the third century we've got cities being completely like ruined, we've got population decreasing. We've got trade ending. Now, if military expenditure in some cases were 50% more than the previous time, how do we possibly pay for an army? What they did is, and it became the concept of what we call later serfdom, it was called colonae. And in Latin, it's uh, serf is from Latin of service, which originally was the concept of a colonae. The idea was if the, the only way the em emperor could pay for these bills was to have a tax base. Now, how do you stop people moving about? You make them fix to the land. So with the Colonial Agreement, the idea was, is, okay, I, let's say I used to be a merchant, a businessman. Let's say I used to have property of my own. That's all gone now. How do I, have, how, and again, it's this idea of a reciprocal agreement. I'm doing something in exchange for something else. So in this Colonial situation, in this, what we call serfdom, the, uh, the guy would be given a plot of land, his own property, his own house, and luckily for it, if he agreed to this term and condition, and it was all written down, there can't be any excess costs appearing. They can't just throw a tax on it. So there was every incentive for someone in this time, if you had nothing, to pledge yourself to someone. And the idea is, is that, let's say there was originally a city, populous, and people could trade. Instead, people would move to villas, and the guy would presumably have some soldiers around or some way of defending you, and in exchange for protection, you then either work for him and give him money, or as time went on, money became defunct, it became a uh, pain in kind. So instead of it being you owe so many denarii to the crown, or to the emperor, instead it's all so many uh, barrels of wheat, so many barrels of wine, so many leather. This, obviously what happened as well is, is because during this systemic problem of the crisis of the third century, money becomes debased as well. So it's not just a fact that we're trying to pay 50% extra for military expenditure, we're also, money is decreasing. We have a problem whereby they take the silver out of the coins. So eventually then this becomes a big problem. People finally figured that out. Because we have it today, for instance, like when currencies don't fully, uh, fully tabulate to the, uh, the reality of the situation. So what they'd do is they'd hoard the good money. 
so the bad money are in circulation, the good money would be hoarded. That would usually result also in black market affairs going on, where people would say, well, if I give you the proper money, you give me some... So if I were using the old money, the, uh, the debased currency, you'd be buying rotten tomatoes. If I were paying good currency, and I can find some outside of the market system, they can provide them with better ones. So there was this incentive, in a sense, as the system's collapsing, that money became more or less defunct. And that became, therefore, the concept of where you pay in kind for something. The idea is, is in this agreement, and it was a, it's one of the Diocletian reforms, to stop people moving about in the contract, you bound them to the land. But it didn't just include you, it included your family. So it was a, a really big decision to make, becoming a colonial or a serf. Because you, you could either go out into that wild world that's collapsing and potentially fail miserably, and like I said, you've got no lineage, or you could work with someone. So can you pass me the drink? Um, you could work for someone who in turn would protect you and in theory you wouldn't be taxed any more than you should be. So that was the beginning of what we'd say our present European model of e the dark age model of economics. Now, in this collapsing Roman affair, we had, uh, so like I said, this is the, the beginnings of the manorial system, the basic economic unit of the dark ages. Now at this point they're all clearly of Roman extraction, or like the members of the Roman Empire. What happened is, obviously, the Germanic tribes came in, and what would often happen is instead of just slaughtering everyone, killing them all, these people would usually keep the people alive because they have farming knowledge. You want to get the most productive out of this land. So what more often than not would happen when someone got invaded, there would be an elite change. So let's say it was a villa owner, he'd be slayed, but all his employees, all the colonial or serfs, would, in effect, still keep their jobs. So as the Dark Ages goes forward, you often find this, like in, in my country, for instance, there's uh, areas that are clearly Latin-named. They're clearly of that uh, time frame where these were Roman citizens. As the Anglo-Saxons came in, the original peasants were still Roman, but now you've got an Anglo-Saxon overlord. Uh, that was something called subfudiation. They did that in the Norman Conquest, whereby anyone who died at the Battle of Hastings, uh, their land was instantly appropriated to another lord. But in the process, the people weren't kicked off the land. They had still access to the manorial system and a form of law. The, the, the German... So what, one of the things about the Roman Empire as well, it was it's not as much that the Germans invaded. The uh, army became German. We had a problem. So in this thing, as the empire's collapsing, normally the aristocracy would be the soldiers. Instead, sometimes they'd leave. They don't want to be part of this anymore. The taxation's too much, the job's too much. So often than not, Germanic tribes would come in and do this as federati or join the army. As this system of, again, the unravelling of the Roman Empire, eventually these German military commanders become the power players in Rome. So we get a situation whereby the final emperor of Rome is a, a, a barbarian appointee. And eventually he retires according to Gibbon in 475. That's uh, like I said, the collapse of the Roman Empire is officially that date, but we can kind of date it before 280. There's clearly a systemic problem emerging. Now, even though Rome supposedly collapses in 475, it's not really. I don't even I see it as a continuation. The people who emigrated, we'd say, or we'd say invade, unlike um, today's people who want to um, integrate themselves into our society, do they appreciate our culture? Do they like it? Example, the Ostrogoths, when they were invading, they were already Christian. They respected Rome. They wanted to continue it. Even though, obviously, it's reduced, there was still a glory to it. People today, for instance, when they come, do they still have the same appreciation? When we get newcomers in, do they want to improve this? Do they want to say, I want to part this and make it better? Or do they want financial gain? Do they, have they got a reason for it? So that's the... The caveat of how the Roman Empire got us, the collapse got us into this present situation. So we've got three or four aspects here. We've got the executive, the military, religion, and then we'd say justice. Now, regarding the military aspect, like I said, the, uh, the Germans effectively became the army, and at that point they're the de facto rulers, because we have this concept in proctorianism. Who's actually owning this? So I could have the deed to the land as I'm the emperor, um, problem is in practicality, it's who's got the sword. It's the person who's actually willing to defend it. 
or to say this is mine. So we have uh, this, this. So what happened is, is during the the when finally the Rome's formally collapsed, the German war bands they had a very unique way of doing this. Now it's called the men of the spear. This concept, it's whereby you as free men, because the definition of a free man is someone who is armed. Today we're all free by de facto, you could argue, but back then it was clearly you had the way of defending yourself. The, the king at the time, it wasn't an absolute, it wasn't an autocratic system. Instead, the king himself was elevated by the men of the spear, and what they do is, like the Roman uh, barracks emperors where you're elevated on a shield, the Germans would bang on those, and it's still the same concept today where you bang in Germany on tables. That's one of the ancient links from the past that still exist today, whereby to show your consent to the king, you'd lift him up and shield and all bang yours. This had a situation whereby instead of the king being like the absolute monarch, he's really the first amongst equals. He's the guy who's uh, the face of the war band, you'd call it. So what goes on is in this system, we've got rapid, we've got depopulation. One of the f f aspects of this is if there's less population, property is worth next to nothing. So, example, like Rome, we went from several million to a few thousand in a very short space of time. Property becomes, we've read cases in um, what, you know, the Doomsday Book, whereby a house only cost a few shillings. Imagine that today, getting on the property market, yeah, I throw some coins and I've bought a house. But other aspects were dearer. So there's a case in Rome whereby a guy has a vineyard, there's no one working it, it's going to ruin. Someone trades him a donkey for a vineyard and the source document thinks he got ripped off. He feels that like I was stiff there, I, I would have done it with a good deal, giving one donkey for a vineyard. Imagine that today, we're in a situation, let's say like we've had a rapid population reduction. Property would be, like you say, wouldn't have the same value as always. The, the concept was is if we're not paying an army, how do we pay them? It's in land. So what would happen is, is the war band would all consent to a campaign, the king would lead them. For winning the campaign, you'd be apportioned some land. Now, as we said previously, this was Roman land, but we've got this concept of subfudiation, whereby if I've won the battle against the previous overlord, I'm now the de facto owner of it. That makes him the sovereign of it. One of the aspects behind this as well is if people are being given inherited land, or doled land out from the crown in because of a campaign, and that becomes yours. You then have this interesting concept whereby other cultures didn't have this. So in Egypt, you didn't have private property. The pharaoh was the boss and he owns you and your property. In this case, that's now yours. And there is every incentive in that system to develop it up, to try and build upon. Like say, if I, you know, I'd fought really hard for this and passing it on to my son, I'd expect him to take the same attitude and ethic I had to pass it on to his son in a better condition. So what happened is throughout, for so example, like with the Frankish kings who adopted Catholicism and had a system of, uh, well, they had a direct system of uh, father, son, there were no men of the spear concept in their world. The uh, Carolingian kings, what they did is, is um, they became weak over time because as everybody's doling out this land, eventually you're left with nothing and you get situations whereby these kings become nothing more than figureheads. This came to a head with Charles Martel because he, even though the king was inept and he's living in his palace, Charles Martel actually had the forces on the ground. He had the actual applicable power. Now, what he did is after winning the Battle of Tours, after doing good works to def defend France, he then, his son, Pepin, began consulting with the Pope. Now, at this time, the Pope is in trouble. The Byzantines claim ownership of that peninsula. They claim to be the, the, you know, the, the success of the Roman Empire. The church is there. The problem is the Byzantine, the Roman Catholic church is there. The problem is the Byzantines are nowhere to be seen. So a problem emerges. You've got the city of Rome, the papal see, problem, who's defending us. So what they do is, is then they approach the French. And a concept comes in where they say, okay then, the king's in his palace and he's not helping. Where does power reside? Is it in the physical or is it the spiritual? What, what, what supersedes what? And the logic of the time is, is spiritual supersedes flesh. So this is how you get the concept of divine right to rule, whereby the Pope has actually like ordained the ruler. 
Uh, now, regarding the German experience, how did you guys do it? So, because what I like doing in history is I'd always notice when you're studying about German history, sometimes they're late to the game, but they often get it right, or at least mitigate things that other cultures got wrong. So, the like you said, the concept is instead of being an absolute monarchy, you had a, a war band where they promoted, and in the British system, we'd say this is the kernel, the seed of what we call a constitutional monarchy, whereby he isn't just ruling us because he has this divine right and we're elevating him. But the French kings did it differently. God told me I'm now the boss. Now, what happens in the stem duchies in Germany, obviously Charlemagne unites, well, doesn't unite, he actually conquers at sword point or conversion. He uh, brings the Germanic tribes into the fold of the Carolingian Empire. Um, now, to a certain point, the Carolingians obviously had like a quite hold, hold over Germany. They became weak over time. So what happened is, is all the stem dukes, mainly uh, like Frank, Franconia and Saxony, decided that they'd elevate not a Frank. They didn't go and say, we need a descendant of Charlemagne to rule us. They said, well, one of our own will do it. And you notice the stem duchies correlate perfectly to where the old tribes used to reside on the map. So people go, oh, where did the stem duchies come from? These were ancient tribes who've maintained sovereignty to that area, enough that whereby they are recognised as sovereigns in their own right enough that my sphere counts for something. You're not just ignored, you're taken into account. So what they did is, um, with the Germans, they decided to elevate one of their own, and that's how we have East Francia then turn into something else, another construction. Again, I, I, we're gonna be talking about this later, but like the tale of two Ottos, we're gonna call it, the, um, like, so the Ottian dynasty. The beginning of that was Henry the Fowler, where he got the concept in Germany of whereby we're not just a united nation, it's a confederacy of tribes who all consent to this system. Now, that's very different than other parts of the world. You compare that model of government to the Egyptians. It's, you know, Pharaoh's God, you, you, you know, you're nothing in front of him. This is a very different system. You, you've actually got more importance than the German one. So that's like how the, the executive stroke military aspects behind it happened. Like I said, we had the, the draw of the villa system for economics. We also had the same with what we'd say fortified areas. So if a villa could draw people and produce, the same could in effect work with castles. They used to have like, if you could defend an area, then artisans would go there. If people felt safe, they'd live within your walls. So it's not just the villa system. We also have like, like say, old Roman fortifications, the beginning, the buildings of new ones. So that's the, the idea of, like I said, the, the executive, you could argue, and the, uh, the military. Religion is an interesting one, the next point about this, because that's a valid part of our European ethic and our story. Like I mentioned previously, the Byzantine emperor claimed ownership of the Italian peninsula. Under Pope Gregory, uh, a problem emerged. The Byzantine emperor is nowhere to be seen, and there's Germanic tribes called the Lombards outside the uh, city of Rome. One of the problems is, is these guys are pressing on him and he's left to his own devices. So before he begs Charlemagne's help, how did the city itself survive? Now, this, what happens in Rome is replicated across other urban centres. So in the Roman Empire, usually a city would have ministered by a bishop. Uh, what would happen is, is let's say that the Roman army's gone. There's, there's no money flowing in. Pope Gregory found a way out of this. Instead, he, dis he knew the church had, like, obviously, assets. They had things you could melt down, stuff like, like money, donations. So what Pope Gregory did when the, the Byzantine armies had ravaged Rome and the Lombards are pressing on them, he went, like, so went from a, a town of several million to 30,000. What he did, and it was quite ingenious, he liquidated church assets, paid people money so that it would stimulate an economy. He then made sure that... Um, he had a policy, he'd said, I'm not eating until everyone in Rome has been fed. Now, by doing this, so you had, like, various, like, let's say, the old aristocracy, you've got poor people all in this same boat in Rome. And instead of turning to an emperor, they now turn to the Pope for leadership. And again, it's this aspect of an individual. If we didn't have that individual at that time, again, this state of exception, we wouldn't have had the Catholic Church surviving. It would have probably been dominated by the Lombards, probably the Byzantines could have took it later. One aspect, though, of European civilization is, is that no one power has controlled it all. So it's not like the king has absolutely ruled everything, nor has the church. And you've noticed in, like, we'd say, where does freedom come from? It could come in that gap where you've got a push and pull effect. If you've got, like, a, a, 
a weak king but not necessarily a strong church, there's going to be a cooperation going on. Like I said, whereby uh, Pep in the short went meeting the Pope and finally became the protector of Rome by that purpose. Now, before, like I said, before the Christian structure in, in Rome, it was mainly urban based. This is where the phrase pagan comes from because it means rural. Now, one of the aspects with paganism is that it was very locally based. There was usually a rich patrician who'd sponsor a temple and it's only in that town. Christianity had a global message. It, was, it wasn't locally based. Everybody were involved in the story. So if you've got a city that's failing, economically collapsing, um, that pagan religion would probably go by the wayside. The only way it exists would be in the wilds. In the, the, so example, in Italy, you, in, I've heard it was Dr. Carlo Rowley mention, he says, when you uh, go to Lombardy in the 50s, people would get the hat and doff the hat to a tree. Now, that's in Italy and it's not far from Rome. They're still doing paganism not far away. So clearly the, the impact of Christianity had a, more of an urban aspect to it. As Rome are collapsing as well, you've got like, so the, the office of emperor becomes Pope. Instead of it being a, a prefect, it's now a bishop or a deacon. So the church itself, made, it repackages the Roman administrative system into the church system. Any vestiges of the old Roman Empire are only existent in the, uh, the, the church. Now, as we were saying, the, the church parlayed this, this, they became, in this system, this is one thing I need to mention, the, before Christianity were fully accepted, justice usually resolved around the men of the spear. They were the ones who could administer it. Now, with this problem comes something called feuding. We have this issue whereby, well, if we're all men of the spear, and I disagree with you, well, there's no legal system, so to speak. We're all agreeing to a common framework, but uh, you could have a feud breaking out. This is how we beget the beginnings of rule of law, because people were saying, hang on a minute, we have to subject ourselves to a law code that we all agree to. So we find there's the Anglo-Saxon law code, the Lombard law, co law codes, the Visigothic ones, and the Burgundian ones. Obviously all different, but they've all got very same similarities. One way they mitigate the feud is by bringing in a concept called the Wergeld. Now, today you could argue this is where our concept of compensation comes from. It's in the Bible as well, but in the European ethic, the concept of compensation. So if you killed someone, it would be cost prohibitive. So if, you know, let's say you're not particularly rich and you kill someone, you're probably going to end up enslaved. Because in order to pay the debt, you have to become indentured to pay it off. You know, you can't, can't just write out a loan and say, or an I owe you. It requires you being in, paying the cost. These used to be time limited in some way. So like in the Bible, for instance, we have like seven years of indebted, you know, to pay off the debt again. One of the aspects in the, these legal codes we see emerging as well is, um, again, we've got this perception history that women are sidelined, women don't, aren't legally protected. It's actually the opposite. If you read the Lombard Law Code, women, it's a higher cost of a wergeld to assault a woman or kill a woman than a man. If you kill a man, it's so many solidy. If you kill a woman, it's double. So, and again, the German ethic, there was an army on the move. It was an entire family band. The whole family would provision for the soldier. And in this, if you think about it, the women are necessary for this because, you know, it only takes one guy to sire a load of kids, but it requires women to, to birth them. So the Germans luckily, like saying in their legal systems, women were protected in some regard. So like I said, we've mentioned briefly about like I said, the, the military power, the executive, the church. Uh, one of the things about, like I said, back to the manorial system, is, is uh, when you were a serf, you also had legal entitlement to the local judge. So what would happen is, is, let's say, you know, I'm being ruled by a feudal lord, there's still a rule book. There's still a, like, in other words, he can't, one example, I've got a house and a strip of land. He can't remove me from that. The only way I can leave is to release myself with a fee. So let's say there was an unreputable, let's say um, a guy of ill repute, a robber baron of some kind, and he tried kicking his peasants out, taking their houses. In theory, you'd have legal recourse. You could go to the manor and say, hang on a minute, no, 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 look, it's written there. So that was one of the things, if you were a serf, though, you could get legal representation. Now, like I was mentioning about the, 
bit convoluted. The, so like I was saying about the, the concepts of rule of law being from the men of the sphere, what happened in Germany, and this is again how you guys, if you're gonna do it, it's always best. They rediscovered the Justinian Law Code, which was the Byzantines had wrote it. They finally got hold of a copy of it, just I think about 1000 AD time frame. One of the aspects behind that is, is it outlaws feuding. Now this is crucial to any, any society because once you're all feuding, there's like a, a limitation on development. But when they rediscover the law, Justinian Law Code, it subjects everybody to the rule of law. You could no longer say, well, I'm having a feud with him. It was no, you bring your case to a third party and we all agree with the decision. Now, this was all fine and well, but as time went on, Sometimes you have relapses. Sometimes you go back to the old method of sparring and feuding. This is, became a concept, and it was the same in the Christian concept of a reformation. The idea is, is in the olden days, when things went wrong, they said, we need to go back to as it was. And symbolically, you could argue, this is, I mean, we'll go into this in a minute, but the concept of like the wheel moving and constantly turning. The, the concept, for example, with the European concept of the wheel. We, so, for example, if we say a revolution uh, to like a Russian, they think, turn the system upside down, we want to do a 180 spin of that wheel. In England, because we had this in 1689, when we threw out our king, wrote rules saying that's what you've broken, the Dutch king swore on it, that was an Anglo-Saxon revolution. It's where the wheel goes back to normal again. Uh, in Germany, they took this same concept. The word reform, reform means like go back to the original thing. So. We have this idea, this romanticised idea, like the chivalric court idea, whereby once rulers start becoming, you know, let's say the competent rulers, more civilised, rule of law comes back into place. This doesn't always work. Uh, in Germany, one thing they did, and again, brilliant solution, if this is such an ideal, and this is something that is clearly like we talk about chivalry about this, about like the rediscovering the Justinian law code and subjects themselves to a law system, what German stem duchies and other groups did is they form leagues. A few different groups would say this is the law that we find common between us, not common law as such, but like common between us all. They'd enforce that law. So you'd even have rival groups, in theory, enforcing the, the law of the land. Uh, that, again, it's a common concept, like saying in the West, other cultures don't seem to have this. In European thought process, there is that concept that when, let's say we start out free, and then I become, there's a tyranny, I want to be free again. So our world seems to have this thing in Europe whereby we're trying to get back to the root original, which in our case was being free. Being, being, being enslaved isn't normal in Europe. We, have, we take freedom very seriously here. So, yeah, one of the, one of the, one of the aspects though behind this is if you, like say about the cost of all this, Every time we have a dark age, it takes about a thousand years to get back out of it. Now, one of my observations about today, so I mentioned about depopulation in the Roman Empire. According to the metrics, and this is based off people from Yale University, uh, Dr. Friedman, I believe, he was looking through the numbers, and he says, okay, then birth rates in the West, or to be honest with you, there's, there's a lot of places outside of the West that have got low birth rates, they noticed that, oh, in order to replace a civilization, you need 2.3 children. We're in a situation today, and Japan's in a similar one, where there's a negative birth rate of people are leaving. A civilization can't maintain itself. Now, the, the only way you hope that could happen, back, back to the original point, when we were saying, are the people coming today wanting to improve this? Are they wanting to keep it going? No. So it's not like, like when the Roman Empire fell to like Aryan Christian barbarians, they still respected Rome. In our world, are the people coming here, do they have our best interests at heart? So for instance, let's say we have a negative birth rate and we're all replaced. I pray and hope that the people who are coming here want to you know, keep my ideas going. I don't want my intangible ideas disappearing. And that's one of the problems. Uh, another thing as well is, now I'll, I'll get into this uh, aspect as well, the, the learning process in the Dark Ages, because this, this does tie in. One of the things today is, is we have, despite our advanced societies, our welfare states, the, especially in America, the demographic says this, uh, we've had war on illiteracy, and very few people can spell. A lot of people leave simple education without able to be able to read and write. 
we shouldn't be in that situation. Today of all days, like I say, we're not in a situation like the old and Christian monasteries were. So one of this is why, for instance, learning is so paramount. We had a guy called um, what they call Cassiodorus. He lived during the Ostrogothic Byzantine War. He'd seen cities burned. He'd seen libraries pillaged. And he thought, we've got to keep this information. You can tell from his work, there's an immediacy in his voice. It's like, we need to correct this error. And his idea was, is we take all these works we have, all these books, and we go somewhere remote, it's isolated, no one's going to raid us, and we copy these books. Because he knows, we, I mean, staggering, like I say, Alcuin of York, he has a couple of hundred volumes. In a dark age, that's like a massive library. That's like the Smithsonian by uh, comparison. Uh, like Isadora Seville and other people. We have, uh, just to have a volume of books in the Dark Ages, in itself a miracle. The way these books were constructed, that originally things were in scrolls and papyrus, we can actually tell how we are, because people argue there was no radical economic reduction in the Dark Ages, but we can tell it happened because there's no papyrus in Europe after 700 AD. Or there's, normally that would be imported to Europe to use. One of the things the Egyptians did is also, because they had a, how do you call it, a monopoly on the papyrus, if they didn't like you, they won't sell you it. So on the island of Pergamon, and this is where the phrase parchment comes from, from the French parchement, which is Pergamon, they, instead of using papyrus, were, it's, example, if I'm using papyrus, I would have to undo a scroll, put weights on it at each end, and I'd have to go through it all and finally find the chapter and verse I'm after. And as well, let's say I'm storing that, and it's on a shelf. There's, how do you tell what that is? It's not obvious. And likewise, I can't write on the back side with papyrus. It's rough. That's why you've got like, the front and back side writing. With the advent of something called the Codex, uh, originally this was Roman shorthand. Uh, jurists would use it, legal professionals. They'd have two pieces of wood with wax on it, and they would scribble like the journalists would do today, shorthand, where you can get the information quickly. Uh, Matthew in the Gospel, we think one of the reasons that's accurate is because he could write shorthand. He was a tax collector. So this is kind of verifiable. And the, Paul the Apostle makes a reference to this. He says, bring my codexes in one of his epistles. And you're like, you don't mention scrolls. So clearly, and this is the thing, the old uh, intellectuals, they would only use a scroll, and they were sticking to that idea. The new Christian groups, and this is a strange one, people say it's anti-intellectual. Yet these people had a better information transfer rate. They were able to write things in shorthand, not just on the front, but on the back side. Because when you're using parchment, you stretch the sheepskin, and you can write both sides legibly. Um, and again, the production cost to make one of these books was immense. For each book, it would have took several, 50 sheep maybe. Now, in the Dark Ages, people are starving. There's, uh, so monasteries literally were in an entire community. The whole focus was to get this book made. So that's now one of the ideas, back to Cassiodorus, he says, right, so all these codexes, so we've got rid of scrolls now, we've moved to the codex. He says from his works, we've got to get these in a location somewhere else. This becomes the concept in monastery work of transcribing. So one of the things he said, now again, in later monastic life, the classics take a side to the, the biblical book. Cassiodorus, and it's a beautiful idea, he envisioned heaven, paradise, being the vivarium whereby you studied secular and religious work without any issue. And by doing that, he said, was similar to paradise. So I think that's, again, if you compare it to later monastic work, instead of them writing the book down because, oh, it's so important, we've got to write it down, they class that as work. That became, in a sense, if you was in a Christian monastery, you're like, oh, I've write this book again. So they'd put, that were classed as work, that were just as valid as tilling a field shearing your sheep. So that became in itself work, not because of the intellectual basis, but because it was work. Now in the process, we found this. In Germany, there was a monastery called Reichenau. Uh, the only copies of Virgil come from there. You'd, you'd think, like, Italy had had loads of copies of like, various books. No, they end up with, the originals were sent from Italy. The originals were lost in the Ostrogothic War. Most of anything we're reading comes through German monasteries, usually. Like I say, Virgil itself, there's only so many copies from Reichenau. There's only 300 copies of the Iliad which is interesting, and that's the baseline of our work. The, so that explains for instance, how we, how we got to the, the, the papyrus, to the book. Now again, in the German Reformation, when we have a Protestant and Catholic disagreement, one thing that 
again, changed the world. And again, Germany did it, and we're all grateful for it, because I, I will not have any books unless uh, the Gutenberg printing press. And by, so we've, we've gone from scrolls to codexes, you know, usable books. Now I can print these books. So these ideas spread far and wide. So from what starts out, strangely, is supposedly an anti-intellectual movement becomes the vanguard of intellectualism. The only way of being educated in the Dark Ages was through a monastery. And unlike, you know, what was quite good about it is, let's say you're an orphan left on the steps of a monastery. We don't even know your background. You could be anybody, but you could take an illiterate, you know, just an orphan, and you could turn him into an illiterate genius. And that one of the things, like I say, any form of education would have been through the monastery. The other character at this time, it's five, so Cassiodorus and Boethius are sort of coterminous to each other. The, this guy's called uh, Boethius. He um, was involved in politics in the Ostrogothic War, fell on the wrong side of it, uh, was sentenced to death. One of the things he does while he's awaiting his death, he has a vision, he claims, of philosophy personified. Now, he is now St. Boethius, but you read his book, he's clearly not a Christian. He's bringing Greco-Roman thoughts in to the modern, like, to, like, to the, the Christian world. One thing he says, and again, call, arcing back to this wheel concept, because symbolically it makes perfect sense. Like I said, we go from freedom to tyranny, back to freedom again. Boethius says the wheel is always turning. We cannot change it. That's something we cannot... Well, I'm hoping now we can. We can notice that the wheel's changing. We might be able to stop this systemic collapse. Boethius said, no, the wheel always turns. One thing he did, though, notice, he says, regardless of whether that wheel's turning, I still have my own mind. No one can take my thoughts from me. So again, the sovereignty of your mind, because we have this concept, for instance, in slavery, or like indentured servitude. I can only be, right, so if I'm captured in a battle, I don't have a choice in it. But let's say I am willing to give my sovereignty away. That's in, you know, if I'm a man, you know, let's say I'm, uh, you know, in the Dark Age model, or I used to be a, a, a merchant and now I've got nothing. It's up to me to do this. I'm not being compelled to. And it's, they've said in uh, the development of history, they said reciprocity, a key word in what we guys talk about, is the medieval system, the Dark Ages. We have a system of whereby the peasant works for all, the soldier fights for all, the priest prays for all. So in that triangular relationship, everyone has a place in it. So obviously now today we might say, was the church necessary? What, what, did it have a role? Or were they like taking money where it weren't needed? No, they were providing welfare, they were providing, providing education. Now obviously today, a lot of these things have devolved onto the state. But back then it was a crucial thing. There wasn't schools, there wasn't hospitals. In effect, a, a monastery was all three. It was a learning place, a place where economic development and health costs. So, yeah, them two characters are influential in our, and it's seldom, seldom spoke about usually in history, but the two characters, like I say, Cassiodorus, who invents the concept of collecting books together and transcribing them, and then you have this thing, uh, Boethius, who it becomes instrumental in philosophy, the, the, the book, The Consolation of Philosophy. And like he says, the main thing is he realises from all this, my mind is sovereign. No one can ever take your thought, thoughts from you. No one can ever say, that's wrong. That's in your mind. No one can, you know, I could be proven wrong. But no one can tell me what to think. So that's our, so that's the development. Like I said, this, this is the pattern that emerges. Now, like I said, the, the Germans always do things better, usually. So what happens is, is as time moves on, I'll do a quick, quick drink, first day. As time moves on, uh, the situation radically changes again. We have um, the Black Death. Appearing. Now, what this does is it kind of undermines the feudal system. What this does is instead we go back to like the Diocletian days. We've now got a city with no one in it. We've got people moving about. So the death nail for feudalism, and in Britain, it, it, that's one of the reasons. It, we abolished it formally in 1500, the concept of you actually formally insert. But for a lot of countries, like say Russia, it wasn't until late 1800s, they'd finally abolished it. We early on abolished it. The... The change of feudalism across different countries was very different. One big example is, isn't it? Not bad mouth in the French, but the French Revolution. That was the end of feudalism. That was bloodletting, that was a bloodbath. How did you Germans solve it? Quite an ingenious method. Uh, you'd get loans out, buy the land off the peasant. So instead of him being like, uh, you, you basically give him a cash, not a check, but some money, and say, right, you can now, you've got, I've bought your land off you, you can now be a, uh, a 
tenant farmer from it. You know, you know, there's no feudal obligation, but you can still live here and you can still work from it. Other people in Germany had a different idea. They would go to America. They'd been given a cash check. Oh, see you lads, I'm off. So what, what one of the aspects behind this as well is, it's interesting, it, even though they're obviously trying to uncouple the feudal system, there was still a loyalty aspect in the German one, which was lost in other countries. So in France, the aristocracy, rank stupidity, like example, we were talking about Marie Antoinette, we were mentioning about how she um, wanted to become a shepherdess, dyed some sheep pink, put perfume on. Not being that's not what German nobles would have done. They were, they were hard working people. So what you find is, is as feudalism's finishing in other countries, Germany, strangely, gets through it okay. Or not okay, I mean, don't get me wrong, there was a bit of bloodletting. So for instance, the imperial free knights from the Holy Roman Empire, unfortunately, they did get killed. But that's compared to everyone, other revolutions around the world, it was quite amenable. So yeah, the, the German experience, like I said, we call it the, I'd like to talk, spend a minute now. I mentioned briefly something called the Tale of Two Ottos. Uh, the first guy in this is a guy called Henry the Fowler. Like I said, he was the man who was elevated to the role of a king. What he did is, instead of it being separate tribes, this, you know, warring factions, he then confederated the German-speaking people. He began from Saxony and Franconia, and from that expanded outwards. One, like I said, one of the crucial things about him was, is instead of it being the crown as, uh, sorry, the, the Pope has said I'm the boss, the people said he was the boss. As we go through the Holy Roman Empire period, we notice a very big disconnect compared to other countries. Um, the church, normally, they would have children. Celibacy is something that's relatively new in the church. Uh, originally, priests had children. Again, more of a literate class. Because the problem was with Christianity after celibacy, anyone who's a big brain person, clever, sorry, it dies with them. You have to hopefully have trained an orphan or someone else in the church to at least be at that intellectual level. The one of, again, like I mentioned earlier on, this where does freedom reside? It's in the gap where you have if in the Egyptian system, there could never have been freedom. So one, one, of, the, one of the aspects is uh, in the German system, because the executive is always going to be weaker, the dukes are always strong, and the church, like I said, they then, the emperor began appointing priests to his imperial lands. What that had the ability of is that the emperor got the land back again. So in the German system, other countries, it was... Uh, Usually the church was extremely powerful. In Germany it wasn't. There's this periods when it is, periods when it isn't. But you notice in this uh, vacuum, there's strangely more freedom in it. Now, the overall, the, the overall, like I said, the, the, the tale of two Ottos. So you have Henry the Fowler, the man who begins the concept of a, uniting the German people. One thing, and again, it's this big word, reciprocity. One thing, and it's the greatest German, I think, Otto von Bismarck, one of the best Germans. What he did is he united a people, and it was in a time of great economic change. You've got rapid industrialization, you've got the rise of socialism. What does he do? He undercuts the left. By having, uh, he brings in concepts like the welfare state into Germany. He brings in concepts like pensions, disabled benefits. So the idea is in the German system that Otto von Bismarck did, envisioned, it's a reciprocal one, whereby the king is the first uh, servant of the state and he's doing it all for the public good. He is subject to the law. But then you've got this thing whereby what's your part in society? And the German experience was is, you work hard for me and I'll do something for you. And one of the things he noticed in it, before Bismarck's reforms, there was, like I said in the previous system, there you go, check, you can go to America if you want. As well, the American colonies were a massive draw of German immigration. That stopped very, very, very quickly because he was able to encourage Germans to stay. You didn't have a reason to leave and to flee and make a new life. It was like, I actually enjoy this. And again, you felt like the state had your back. You knew that if I lose my legs in an iron mill, I would be looked after. You knew that there would be a welfare system in the sense of like there would be medical care for me. There were education and stuff. I mean, one of the things the Germans did is uh, promote public hygiene. Now again, if you compare this to other countries whereby they don't have that, like say America, one of the draws were big income, but it's high risk. So what the Germans did is say, okay then, relatively okay income, but you get a lot of benefits for being here and staying. 
So we're quite thankful for bottled because, like I said, the world, the Germany we're in today, this is the tale of two Germanies. You've got and two guys. You've got Henry the Fowler and the Holy Roman Empire, and then you've got the Prussian Empire and Otto von Bismarck. And in that, like I said, he, what I find nice about Bismarck is, is despite the fact he was thrown out of, well, had to resign, even in his last days, he was sat in a wheelchair at his house saying, I'm here to advise you. If you ever need me, you know, work, find me. So he was always a first servant of the state. That was his idea. So with that in mind, then, if we've, let's say, we've looked at how unique our European experience is, my question to you would be, is it worth preserving? I think it is. Is, is it something, like I said, we've got private property, common property, and the intangible? This is all three. If you're a German and you own a house, that's your house. That road outside, though, it's not yours, but you've paid for it. But yet the experience is intangible. This is, this is something that's unique. It's worth fighting for and worth preserving for. And again, what I'm terrified of in our modern day is how people are very quick to forget. We always have this phrase in history, it's doomed to repeat itself again. I'm praying that in the past there was a wheel that spun around and we could, we, apparently we had no control over it. Maybe we can put some brakes on this wheel. Maybe we could bring it to the, the bottom of the wheel again where we were free. Maybe that's what we need to do. So, like I say, with that, I would, uh, I would say, like I say, strive for the better, maintain integrity, and this is worth preserving. Beyond, that, that is what I would be up for. Yeah, thank you very much, Rick. Again, you've done an absolutely amazing job at, at stringing together all these incredible historical facts and all these references and all these cultural points. And it's something which you are, you have an absolute gift for it. So yeah, thank, thank, you. thank you very much, Rick. Okay, uh, up next we have Pontus, the, the, the brains behind this, uh, this think tank, the guy that's been organising um, all, all the meetups with, uh, with what came before and who will be organising them into the future. Um, he's a, 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 learned, a learned young handsome man from Sweden, so do forgive him on that part. <laughs> And, uh, and um, I guess you will come and talk now. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Pontus. Absolutely great job. Hello, everybody. <laughs> My name is Pontus Busk. Uh, on the internet, I go to nickname is Pullman for the people watching at home. Um, we're here in beautiful Germany to talk. So all of you just listen to Rick having his uh, spurg about history. But there are a few concepts that, his, uh, that he took up that I think is golden to continue talking about. So what we wanted in a sense, or what we kind of think, is because every history, have every time in how civilization worked is through a cycle. It will go through different waves of destruction and rebirth. But the way to kind of stop what I'm seeing right now and what I've kind of, we all kind of observe as some sort of a destruction is to understand how to, well, understand through history and understand today what we did wrong in, in the past and what we can do now to change that. So one of the terminologies that we use, for example, is reciprocity. In any tra transaction, there should be sort of the same value to both of the persons. So we have the, of all of you, Sadly, not the people here, but the people in the room, they have the freedom in front of us. So whenever a transaction is, 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 is point, uh, pointed out, a political transaction at the same time, there should be the known cost of the other person should be known to them, and this, they should accept it, and it should be sort of a reciprocal relationship. A reciprocal relationship between me and the government, for example. The point why Otto von Bismarck, for example, is actually good during his time, is he created policies that, you know, again, if I broke my leg, I get help as a reciprocal. So meaning I can work, but I know that the government can also help me. In that sense, I will pay taxes. So in a sense that when it comes to sort of these types of transactions and, and why the balls in particular is very interesting and, and all of South Africa is that they're missing certain European traits that we learned here that they do not understand. Richard, in his speech, talked about the elite replacement of land. So during a conquest in Europe, the serfs and the, 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 the folk of the farms was never replaced in and of itself. What was replaced was the elite. But what is elite today has kind of changed. 
So whenever reciprocal relationship or transaction happen, it's not, it's a lie that, that it actually is supposed to be reciprocal. That is because it's based on false premises. And I'll talk about this later, how to fix false premises. Um, so when it comes to, again, South Africa and, and, and the rest of that area is the transaction that is done isn't reciprocal for the people because it's viewed wrongly. So uh, what if, if, if I understand what happened in, for example, uh, Rhodesia or Zimbabwe is the, 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 the blacks there saw a, a, a non-reciprocal, not first, but non-reciprocal relationship between the people there. And as, an, as a response, they thought of, well, I question in of itself, but they thought of another transaction which wasn't reciprocal either because of false promises, uh, premises. The, 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 the landowners in any sort of European context, and of course the people coming down there have a European mindset and intellectual thought already brought there to them, uh, knows that they are not an elite. They are farmers. They are landowners. They are people who are not, whose living is working normally. So if, if someone is to replace, it should not be them. So when uh, they knew the, the, the land, so when the, the, the new governments came up, they thought, well, we just replace, putting new people into the land, and then whatever happened, you, you know what happened. But that's exactly what the Europeans would have not done, because they know if they can't remove the people from the farm, because if they do that, they lose the skill and the know-how of that land. The only one they can replace is the, the, the head of the elites themselves, but not the people who knows the land. And they learned that the rough way. And, but sadly, it doesn't seem like they actually understood that way. But the people there of the European descent knew that because they had lived through added history. That, in a sense, is the way. But a transaction has to be reciprocal in nature. A tooth for tooth and an eye for an eye. <laughs> um, but we kind of talk about a new t uh, type of uh, terminology, or, uh, also between the circle that Richard talked about, which is ownership in total. It's that you own, not in ownership, but you have the property right to, to what you're willing to defend is yours. So there are, first of all, three types of property that we, we find. The private property is what I own, my house, my land, my farm. Then there's common property, it is a road outside of my home. And then uh, intangible property, which is my culture, my thoughts, my religion, also, in a sense, in the commons. But today, many, even in the West here, especially the libertarians of today, which go usually into an influence of Rothbardianism, which is a sense that um, what, the only thing that matters is my private property. As long as my private property is not violated against, it does not matter what happens. But then they miss the two most important parts, your private property is one thing, but you're part of a bigger fish. You're part of a big community. You are not alone. And people forget that I have the right to say how uh, uh, should, it's sadly not, this aspect is sadly missed in today's culture, but I have the right to complain when people destroy the integrity, like the, 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 property, the, the property of the commons and the know-how the ideas, the philosophy of me and the people around me. And this happens everywhere in Europe for the moment, where they say to you, it does not matter what happens there as long as you're safe, as long as your property is safe, but it doesn't matter. So an example that I got uh, when it comes to ownership and total, I got a bit angry about, I said, Let's th say I create a Swedish community in Northeast America, because Swedes moved there, about a million. So we're 10,000 people in the Swedish community up there. And everyone agrees in this community that we want to keep it our Swedish community. But what happens? Well, because in, the, uh, in America, people are free to move state to state without any problem. So all of a sudden, 10,000 Danes came into this little community. And Swedes hate Danes. We fight all the time with them. Um, 
and these people, when I said, said that, well, that's a problem because the people living there in the first place, they decided, hey, I want this to be a Swedish community. Why should now 10,000 Danes, the exact same amount that we were, come into this community? These people answered with, well, they're not in your property. It doesn't matter that they are drunk Danes everywhere <laughs> because they have the freedom to move. But no, they shouldn't. I created that community. My people are Swedish. My people are community. Sweden, the Swedish culture. We want, we want to have midsummer. We want our little weird penis thing in, in <laughs> during midsummer. And we want to dance French uh, things around it. The Danes don't want to do that. I can't blame them for that. But, but because, because I was the one, the Swedish ones, and all agreed that we wanted this way, they shouldn't enforce a difference on that. So, but today in, in all of Europe, uh, the only response you get is, eh, you, you move. Actually, the people who I talked to with this, they told me, well, if you want a Swedish community, you can move. Excuse me? That's what I did in the first place. I, we wanted to create this community. We have decided, maybe we've been there for a few hundred years, we already decided, why should I just move? But this is what they say, just move. And this is the issue with libertarians today. They just say, just move. Conservatives miss the point, they don't think of this. And libertarians just say, move. I can't move. It is my homeland, it's my people. I have decided that this little village in Northeast America, whatever, I decide to move. Uh, should I have to say Swedish? And, I mean, the lo lovely thing is, uh, I do want to visit Northeast uh, America. There's a lot of Swedish communities there. And luckily, not being forced, perhaps, them, but there's a lot of people, which I've noticed throughout uh, the, 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 the world, who is, who is being this forced to accept people they do not want in the first place. Um, and it's, it doesn't just come to that in sort of culture, but it's also, in a sense, the village I, I, I grew up in. Um, there was one thing we all hated, and it was an asylum home being built. It's not a normal asylum home. No, 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 no. This is like high priority, dangerous subject. It's a prison. It's actually a prison for uh, uh, criminals who do come here, but who commit crime. They're put into this community. We're not a big village, but did they ask us, is it okay if we put this in your village? No, they, they just put it there and we could never complain. We did complain, but it doesn't matter because, oh, you don't own that part of the village. We kind of do. So in a sense, that's kind of what we want to point out. There are many things we want to point out, but that property is not just what is directly owned or um, or property is as in today is actually defined as a universal term of like <laughs> property rights today is silly. Universal terms, it's like, or if you create value to the land, you, it's your property, if you, if you do whatever, but it's, it's no universal terms. Property, not direct ownership, but property, is from what I'm willing to defend. What I'm willing to say, hey, I want this this way. It's not just about, um, it's not just about what I own directly own. So I, I, I just want to understand a little bit how we mean ownership in total as well. It's, it, it, it's true what I'm willing to retaliate against, sort of complain or create violence against. Um, so um, I actually have it's the simplest term I can create or uh, understand, or create this new side of property is let's say I buy a muffin. <laughs> yeah, it's simple. I buy a muffin, put the muffin on the table, and uh, I leave it there. Someone comes, takes the muffin, and I see it. What do I do? Well, either I retaliate, saying, hey, that's my muffin, then it's my muffin, or um, I don't say anything because I don't care. Well, then it's his muffin. It's, it's, it's silly in a sense, but it's it, the point being that, uh, not I'm talking about direct property, I'm talking about more common property um, in that sense. But 
it's what I am willing to care about and defend and fight and retaliate, say, hey, mine. Again, you don't directly own it, but you have the right to say, or should have the right to say, or you do have the right because you have the violence to say, hey, I don't want that to be. Um, so yeah, uh, that is that term. That is missing. Again, it's one of the few things that are missing in today that I personally actually find quite a lot of interest in because I want to keep my little Swedish community with our weird customs, without being forced upon by others. And I'm sad that he left, but that is exactly what is happening in South Africa. That's exactly what's happening in these communities. Because I know that the, the, the people who came there in the beginning, they, they, didn't, you know, they didn't massacre everybody there, they just created communities. They created people, they, you, you became sort of a new type of people there which you wanted to have. You wanted to have that. And because of that, you shouldn't have been, you shouldn't be forced saying, hey, no, you're not allowed to be that because, because other reasons. No, you say, you have the right to say, because you demonstrated that I had the right to own uh, pro property, uh, the right to complain, right to retaliate, the right to say, I am. All right, moving on. The other two terminologies that we actually use quite a lot, so kind of the point I wanted to go in the beginning, but I didn't. We are a natural law think tank. So um, uh, the point of natural law of, um, is the famous Aristotelian cons uh, picture, of, no sorry, the famous Aristotle picture in Plato. You have seen Plato hold his hand up, you see Aristotle hold his hand forward, and I usually say in the postmodern world, there is a hand pointing inwards. <laughs> This is what is truth, like what they claim to be truth. And uh, for us, this can only be one truth, and that is what is, uh, you testify to be true, which is uh, you have to have a language that can prove that it in, uh, empirically is truth. So, so we have created a method of language to do this, and uh, I'm not going to go into that too, too much in detail. But the language is, especially in transactions, uh, is that you have to be clear without deceit in language when claiming a truth to be the case. So a lot of uh, lies today has, is created through language itself, because they claim truth through falsehood of language. And the way to fix this is, you, you heard of, well, both of you have theses, probably some other few have. The, the, your, uh, whomever is your uh, teacher have probably said, can you operationalize your thesis? Maybe not, but what they mean by that is, can you, can you without any emotional terms, any, you're not allowed to say like in the thesis, say what it's about what it's claiming and what it's about as properly as you possibly can. So through it, so th this needs to go beyond just you know, your, your normal thesis, but through what is a transaction. That you need to be clear what the transaction is. What am I, especially in politics, especially in politics, what am I voting for? What are you claiming? Are you screaming, okay, no, actually, perfect example, when it comes to uh, Greens, not the party, but the environmentalists, they like to scream a lot of emotional idea without being clear, or haven't operationalized their language to say, this is what we want without any emotional attachments to it. Uh, so yeah, so, so we need a clearer language to, pr to, to to say what is truth in a transaction. Uh, there are multi multifaceted category, but one of the categories within this is what we call testimonialism. Um, and it's what is, um, it's an empiricistic concept. It's what is provable. So if I make a claim, it has to be, uh, repeat, be, be possible to be repeatable and proven. 
um, testable. testable, thank you. So in a, but in a court case, for example, if you go into court, you have to testify, that you make a claim. And this claim in the courts doesn't matter in the first place until it can actually be proven that that actually, what is claimed in the testimony has happened. So if, if I claim that, no, actually, that's it. If I claim that I own something, I can claim it, but can I prove it? Can I actually retaliate? Can, can I say it? So, muffin. I can say, in a sense, I own a muffin. Now I'm not talking about the body, it's a muffin there. I can say, yeah, I own a muffin. But uh, do I? Not until it's provable. So, um, so if someone takes it and I don't do anything, meaning I haven't actually shown or retaliated or sort of made my claim true, then it's not the case. You can make, you can make a testimony, but you have to be able to prove that it is correct. So a, a testimonial claim of a transaction is actually, uh, I had um, a real life occurrence where uh, a man from, I was in Turkey, a man in the bar said, I want to start a business with you. I said, okay, weird. He wanted to sell alcohol to Sweden. I said, okay, he, and he made his claim, which was, uh, I need you to help me translate into Swedish, and then I will give you money. But instead of you know, being very clear exactly what he should, he didn't operationalize the language, he didn't claim it truthfully, he said, he jumped to a conclusion of what would possibly happen if I go through him, which is a lie. He said, well, if you work with me, you can buy a Ferrari. So, you know, if I shake your hand, then I'm working for you. On the pretense of I will own a Ferrari, that shouldn't be an actual transaction that should occur. And a lot of what is happening today is this type of lie. So, the biggest sort of lie that hurts of today is, I call it the old granny scam. So a uh, telephone salesman, they call your grandmother and they state that sh she will get a good deal without claiming what exactly this deal is. This, this is not a language of a clear transaction through this, uh, through, through what he wants to say. So to, to make this a uh, proper operationalistic language, you need to say, Granny, you will get, sign a contract for three years. And fully be honest, without any emotional, uh, any assumption or any emotional um, language when the transaction is made.